But what's interesting is when we speak often about the covenant of works, some people obviously know that it's a Reformed doctrine, but might think that it was invented entirely somehow by Reformed theologians, and it's just an imposition on Scripture. It's something that's uh, uh, constructed uh, by scholastics or something and just added uh, to the text. But one of the major themes of your book, obviously in light of its title even, Catholicity and the Covenant of Works, is that Usher is, is uh, even though he's living in tumultuous times and and dealing with the Reformation and the development of these doctrines at the time and, and all the ecclesio, ecclesiological, ecclesiastical matters, he's still working with, in many cases, ancient sources. I was wondering if you could uh, open the door for us a little bit, help us understand some of the traditional teachings that he appropriated, even from ancient and medieval sources, in developing uh, what we know today as the Covenant of Works, the doctrine of the Covenant of Works. Yes, certainly. And that's, I, I, I guess, as a, as a preface and side note, I hope that this is one of the, the valuable things that this book can do for the church. I mean, that's up to others to decide. But at the same time, I'm really hoping that, that the church will find this, this useful um, in reminding us that Reformed people aren't really innovative, uh, that we are you know, perhaps we have new terms that we've put on categories, and that's true, and I don't think that's a problem, uh, but we're working within a very traditional, we're Reformed Catholics, right, as, as William Perkins put it, yeah. as people are more and more liking to put it today, and there is a Catholicity, an ecumenical nature to Reformed assumptions. We might have a new apparatus for it, uh, but we shouldn't think that we've got to to reinvent the wheel, there are some things. There are some things that are distinctively reformed. Uh, we maybe shouldn't seek after as many distinctively reformed things as we have at times. <laughs> sure. Uh, we and sometimes that's gotten us into trouble. Uh, that's a different conversation. Uh, but so one of the things after deciding that okay, I'm going to focus this whole thesis on the covenant of works. I kind of really wanted to do two things. Uh, one, uh, Richard Muller is, is obviously, you know, the unsurpassable name in Reformed historical theology, uh, but every dissertation records everything that Richard Muller has said <laughs> uh, and, and kind of gives a synopsis of his career in, in some ways. And, and I, I wanted to make the, the self-conscious decision. What if I don't, what if I start with the premise that actually Muller doesn't need my help in, in re making his point? He succeeded, and I'm too much of a dwarf to, to come along and, and think I'm making anything extra to his point. So what if I just assume that as the starting point? Uh, there's continuity between earlier stages uh, of, of Christian tradition and what Reformed people are doing. Take that for granted, and let's move ahead. Okay, well, the second thing then becomes, if I'm looking at the covenant of works, how do I pull the lid off uh, this doctrine and look under the hood uh, perhaps in more depth than, than I've seen it considered in print at least than, than before, and really try to give an idea of the inner workings of, of how this came together and why it would be a natural conclusion for Reformed Christians to reach. And there's a couple of things. I mean, uh, you, you know, within in the context of the early Reformation, well, covenant as a category is becoming more and more used uh, in our theology anyway. So there's that. There's the linguistic aspect within the Reformation. Uh, but if we look further past that, well, Christians have all, always had uh, a notion of, of nature. Creation is important to us. Uh, we still talk about creation, fall, redemption, uh, and Christians have talked about that in, in various terms always. And, and uh that means the doctrine of creation is important in our tradition. Well, the law in various ways is also important. And, and since the early church, and increasingly so in the medieval church, this notion of a natural law uh, was, was important, that, that God didn't make up the Ten Commandments uh, when he revealed them at Sinai. But as our confession says, uh, the law that he gave to Adam was handed down to Moses to top Mount Sinai. So this moral law, the, the natural law that Adam had as a, as, a crea uh, as a creature meant to represent God as his image, 
The law summarizes God's character. Adam as God's image uh, is meant to reflect that character. And so by nature, inescapably, he knows the law, the moral law. Uh, and that's revealed again at Mount Sinai. And, uh, you know, Tertullian is talking about this in the ancient church. It's, it's bouncing around in other ways. Thomas Aquinas does a lot with this. Uh, there's more in the book about Thomas than I originally expected. Uh, I thought it would be a fascinating little side point here and there uh, at times. Uh, but this was years ago when I was doing this. And, and then it kind of just blew up. And I thought, well, I, I've actually got to do something with it uh, and, and say uh, th- there's a fascinating aspect in that, though, when we think about Thomas on natural law, to see how the Reformed are using him and how they're using the medieval tradition uh, in regard to natural law. Well, Thomas thinks basically what I ju- – not exactly, but essentially what I just said, that – uh, God's character is summarized in the moral law, um, and that's why it's immutable and it's given to us in, in the natural law. Um, when you set that against it, now, we may not like everything that Thomas said, and that's fair and reasonable, 100%. But one of the things I tried to do is, well, if you look at him next to the other medieval figures, I did it on natural law, uh, and you have some of them saying, uh, well, the natural law is actually non-existent. God could command someone to hate God, uh, and they should just do that. Uh, That would then be right. Uh, Or a more moderate, so that would be kind of the Occamist view, um, a a hard voluntarism. Uh, And then you've got like a Franciscan category of natural law, which kind of says, well, the first two commandments, uh, under the Roman, what we would consider now the Roman ordering of the commandments, well, those are natural. And, and sort of immutable, but the rest, you know, are up for grabs. Well, in that context, in, in the medieval options, as the Reformed are looking at the medieval options for natural law, I think, well, Thomas seems like the, the obvious preference. doesn't mean you have to go with him all the way, but it's kind of like, well, of those, I like that the most. Uh, and so uh, you have a, a sort of Thomistic appropri- or an appropriation of Thomistic natural law that Usher uses uh, that that harks back to the ancient church. Well, and then you've got this idea of Adam's headship, which it, Christians who believe in a doctrine of original sin, have, which is basically everyone except Pelagius, uh, with whom we disagree. Uh, you know, everyone who believes in original sin has some version of Adam's headship. Uh, and now whether that's sort of more um, forensic and legal as it becomes in the covenant of works, or if it's more, uh, you know, however you want to parse it out, otherwise biological or natural or, uh, or genetic, uh, you know, uh, is sort of aside from the point that they believe in Adam's headship. Well, then we get to Usher and the doctrine of the covenant of works. So you've got uh, a growing use of the covenantal category. You've got, uh, he is a, is a researcher of the patristic tradition uh, and ready to draw on that and the best of the medievals uh, to bring together natural law and then Adam's headship and bring that to bear for Protestant soteriology. You've kind of got a, a ball of yarn that gives us the covenant of works out of a lot of really ecumenical and traditional premises. Uh, these, these, uh, things that are trailing into the the covenant of works are perhaps repackaged under this label, but it's a set of binding them together under a category is not an innovative move. It's really just tying threads together of the ecumenical tradition. And I think that that's really what Usher has done uh, in his context. I mean, and, and that's, uh, that's a comment on really what we did as a, the reformed tradition. Uh, Perhaps Usher did it very visibly because we can see him as an individual working over these historical ideas. Uh, But I think that's essentially what happened in our tradition.